I thank you for this time. Now, Lord, would you come and bring the power of your presence in the midst of us? Now, Lord, living in a world where you're not exalted, there's a weariness that comes over us. I ask that you, by your mercy, would release the power of peace over us. Be in the midst of us, Lord. And this relationship we're supposed to have with you when it comes to the idea of identity and destiny, would you awaken that? Would you give us back that joy? So that we would want to not only understand this, but actually experience the reality of the joy that's in the midst of this. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen. All right, as we always get together, uh, for your guys' benefit, we always kind of do a real quick review. I don't want to spend too much time trying to go over all that, so I'm just going to kind of write it up here, make a statement about it, and then get on with what we want to talk about. When we say that you have a destiny... The Bible gives what we call categories of what a destiny means or how God, by his spirit and the word, begins to develop this inside of you. And so when, when we're here, we're not just trying to say, well, let's just try to figure out um, how to get on with whatever our purpose is. There's a, a really neat, unique way that Jesus comes to you and I and begins to work this in your life. So like if you never come to this class, this still is going on in your life. This is how God is relating to you. Okay, so the first thing that he begins to do is he wants you to know who you are. And so this thing about identity becomes this really intense reality. Now, when I say identity, that you, your identity is being restored, the Bible basically says, look, God loves you. And because he loves you, he wants you to know how his relationship with you now is. There's a lot of misconceptions about who God is, how he looks at you, and how he begins to minister to you. And so when you come to him, he begins this dynamic. Now, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be hard for people to understand if every time we talk about identity, I'm just saying, well, see, that's the way God's showing you he loves you. But really, that's what's going on here. Don't ever miss that, okay? No matter what topic we're talking about, we're encapsulating into the fact that this is how God expresses love to you. Okay. So, um, this is kind of interesting. I want you guys to, just for a moment, I've never done this before, but I want you to kind of draw this on your piece of paper. This is sound, this are wavelengths where sound is carried. Okay, and there are two parts to a wavelength. All right. The top part of a wavelength right here carries the message. Down here, this carries the frequency. So what, why am I bringing that up with destiny? When I said that everything communicates the love of God, that's the message. The frequency, whatever we're talking about, that's what the message is. But if it's not given in love, it becomes confusion to people. Okay. So think about di dialogues you have with people. Anytime you present truth without love, it creates law. Legalism, I'm sorry. stress in people's lives. When I and, but when I don't create, communicate truth, but I have love, that causes confusion also. And the confusion is you sense the love. The love actually touches your heart, but you don't know how to live it because you're not being given truth. So this idea of your destiny, I've given you the message, but please don't miss the frequency. The frequency is God's love. We have to communicate that. It has to be understood, or this stuff will be truth, but it, you'll try to fulfill it or walk it out based on never feeling good enough because you're missing the heart of it. The heart of it is God is expressing his love to you. Okay? Could you repeat that? Uh, truth without love is what? Law. It creates yeah. law. And then love without truth? Uh, it creates confusion. It creates confusion. Yeah, because you, you, don't, you sense the love, but you don't know how to live because they're not telling you the truth. Mm. Well, wait, what was the last one? Love without truth is? Uh, so, uh, the first one is, when you're given truth without love, it creates a law-like or pharisaical way of living. It's true, but it, it's, uh, you don't sense any love in the middle of it. But if you, if you don't tell the truth, you just have a message, but, it doesn't, but you feel love, it creates confusion because you can't walk out what you feel in your heart. It 
doesn't make sense. So would it be okay to say love without truth is confusing? Yeah, it is. So uh, if you were here last night, do you guys remember the people that were with me last night? I talked about what is Christian liberty. So I could, I, the idea is God's expressing his love through that. But if you don't hear the truth, you don't know how to walk it out or what it looks like. You just know, well, God loves me, but should I just go and do whatever I should do? And so do you guys get it? This has to be, when we talk about any topic, whether it's destiny or whatever it is, there's a message. The message has to be based in truth, but it has to have the frequency of love connected to it, or it, it creates legalism in people. It creates a confusion of who God is. Okay, now the next thing. Um, when we say that the idea of identity is an expression of love, the next thing that God actually does is once you have that, you have to have an awaken to the idea of what love is supposed to produce inside your soul, and this is the second part of your destiny. I want to have passion or zeal. You guys, uh, there's this really cool quality that Jesus constantly talks to the disciples about, and if you guys are like I am with the disciples, Jesus says these things, and I think well, he's not really serious about this, but he actually is. When we point to the idea of zeal or passion, the term for zeal uh, in the New Testament means to burn. But it doesn't mean just to burn out, like we think it means. It means to burn with purpose. Now, when I say that I burn with purpose, here I have a destiny, right? But the only way that I can express burning, it isn't a negative thing. It actually means that the, there should be this ever-increasing joy in my soul as I'm realizing this. This is the idea of what zeal and passion is. It's to be joyful and joy-based. Isn't that amazing to say that to you guys? So as I'm doing the things that God has created me to do and I'm walking in relationship with him, there should be this joy that's so attractive that it awakens my heart, but awakens everybody's heart around me. Because, you guys ready? What is the heart longing for? The heart is longing for joy. That's, what, that's one of the things we lost when our ancestors decided to do what they did with what God told them to do. When they rebelled and man fell, the, the thing that happened to him wasn't not just, it was called paradise lost. Well, the first thing that you experience in paradise is, is joy. It's In fact, it's ever-increasing. And so when we talk about this idea that you have a destiny, you want passion awake, and it comes from identity. Once God starts loving you to where you're satisfied with him, you become very passionate about that, and it creates a zeal inside of you, and then it's supposed to result in you having joy. And so when people say, well, what is it God has created you to do? As you're expressing it, they... You guys remember back to the frequency? They feel the joy that's actually pulsating in your heart, and people yes. long for that. They want to be a part of that. Then the third part is vision. As I, as, I, um, as I begin to awaken to my identity, passion, what happens is God and I start doing this really weird thing. It's called dreaming. Now, dreaming in the Old and New Testament, it's kind of funny. The word for dream, the Hebrew word for dream, also means to create. Isn't that interesting? And so when I, the, you hear people throw these terms around, you need to be visionary or you need to dream with God. Well, the reason they're saying that is that means that's the most creative thing that God has bring, brought you into experiencing. You were created to have this encounter with dreaming and be led by dreams or visions of your whole entire life. Um, I'm trying to figure out, I, I, I haven't gone through historical Christianity to figure out where we decided we didn't need that. But it's a wrong concept to think that you're supposed to figure out your life outside of relationship with God and dream with God. See, a dream from God has a creative release from his presence that where you didn't have an ability to do something in this process of dreaming, the ability is released inside your soul. And it becomes incredibly exciting and incredibly dynamic to live that way because you're, you're living with the, the resource of life consistently energizing and strengthening your inner man. It's really kind of fun. Because without this, that without this creative dreaming being released inside of you, the struggle is with hopelessness. Okay. 
Let's see if I can make that make sense. Hopelessness is, uh, first, what is biblical hope? Okay, now it says that the hope of the unrighteous is vain, which means it has no power behind it. But the hope of the righteous will be satisfied. So what is hope? You guys ready? The word for hope in the New Testament specifically means, you guys ready? Viewing what's going on in heaven, what's in the future, and what can only be experienced up there and pulling it into time now. That's what hope means. So this whole idea of dreaming with God, God's kingdom is established in heaven right now. All the stuff that's going on up there, all the creativity and all the good things that God has that you're going to experience in the future, once you're able to view this and dream with God about this, it's pulled into time and you live based on this as a resource. Okay, so with everything that's going on in my life right now, that's what God's doing to me. Isn't that great? And what do I do with it all? Just enjoy it. It's mind-blowing. Yeah. And I can't move sometimes because my heart hurts so bad, and then he's doing that to me in the middle of it. Yeah. And it's insane. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Of course. Okay, now, think about this, guys. Um, we just, we throw around the word hope all the time, right? Hope, 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 right? Bob hope. Yeah. We even use it as campaign slogans. What's that hope? But really, there's only one place where hope is based on a, a reality and an experience that's eternal, that is ever-increasing and life-giving if you learn to draw from the resource of it. So I hang out with Jesus, and what he does is he opens my eyes to see what's going on in heaven, I begin, and he begins to share his dream with me, and then we say, well, what you, what I see you and me doing and what you're showing me in heaven, if I come into alignment with it, it can get expressed on this planet, and God is saying, yes, finally someone's got it. Mm-hmm. And then all the stuff that the culture bases its existence on, oh, if I have enough money, well, if the economy goes well, if everyone's happy, then I can do these things. You're not based on that reality. You're based on an internal, unshakable kingdom. And it, and it solidifies something in your soul that you're longing for, which is called stability and security that does not come from the realm of the physical. Can we stop right here and just work on that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> can, we, can we stand on that? Like, yes. Something recent that stop you right here. Well, you guys got all I haven't even started the lesson. This okay. Um, this is good. Well, here's, if you want the scriptural example, Jesus modeled this in John 5, 19, one of my favorite scriptures. I only do what I see the Father doing. So, guys, that means that you now give time. That, I don't know what your prayer life's like, but I just want to encourage you. Once you kind of ask Jesus for everything in the universe, you should stop for a moment and say, well, what, in regard to where I'm at right now in my life, What's your perspective? You're asking God to show you how he sees this time in your life. And then what he does is he comes and visits you and says, well, here's my perspective on it. And the first thing it does is it settles you. And then it releases hope and faith inside of you. And then there's this reservoir of love that comes up into your your present experience. And And you cannot get this from any other source. And so we don't teach this. We say, well... You know, it's kind of hang out in Christianity, and you might get pounded every once in a while. It's kind of like a thunderstorm. Every once in a while, a thunderstorm comes through a valley, and lightning strikes. Oh, okay. And that's how we see this kind. But Jesus said, no, this is actually the well that you and I draw from if you learn to practice this. So you have to learn to practice receiving, not talking all the time. That's hard to do. Because culturally, we believe, well, you know, hey, I always have to talk to God. Somehow he doesn't understand all this. And the Bible's saying, no, there are progressions. There are times to talk to God, but there are other times to just sit in his presence and let him come and give you the dream he has for you and has for your family. And when you draw from that place, you're going to do stuff that you do not have the ability to do. It's going to fortify you in your soul, and it's also going to change your perspective on reality, and then you're going to start living like a person that actually resides in heaven even though you're walking on the earth. We're now going to work on the section of how to live by vision. What, is it, what does it mean to actually have a vision for your life? Now, I'm not, talk, I'm not going to work through the idea that there is a vision. We're going to be very specific, okay? 
God has created you not to just be a receiver, but to model him while you, live, while you walk and live on the planet. Which means you don't just receive stuff and do nothing. You're not, like the, you're not like a receiver like a computer is. You don't type in information, and then it's downloaded to you, and then you chill out on the couch and never do anything with your life. Like You don't just sit and watch Bronco games as they lose. That's not what Jesus has called you guys to do. Exactly. So this is actually called how vision comes and how to actually chart the steps you're supposed to take to do the thing you see in heaven so it's fulfilled on earth. Okay? So we're actually saying, how does vision become completed? Take the steps. Well, the best way to say it is you're wanting to figure out how to complete what you're seeing, and so the goal, the idea now, is to understand how God gives you goals. Now, when I say goals, the minute you start saying goals, everyone thinks, well, isn't that kind of an earthly concept? Well, let me just kind of work through this if you've ever gone to a business seminar. If you want to be administrative and you want to know how to accomplish things, you're going to have to figure out how to walk out goals. But it did not come from the business community. It came from Scripture. The Bible actually says, guys, this is important that you understand this. God plans everything he does before he does it. It, you're made in his image. And so this idea, I don't have to plan anything, that is a, here we're back to identity, that is a denial of you being created in the image of God. It, it, every, and isn't it funny, when we say the kingdom, or we talk about how God works, we end up assuming that the way the kingdom work, the way the kingdom work is not reflected in everyday life, but the reality of it is, is that God runs a kingdom he administrates a kingdom, and he gives skills and strategies to walk things out. And if we're going to reflect and be like him, we can't just be people that are seeing things in heaven, but not seeing them released on the earth. That's, a, that's an incomplete reality of who God has made us to be. And when you say this to a group of people, there's one group that gets stuck. No, I just want to be visionary, and I don't want to do anything else. And then there's the group that really want to accomplish stuff, but they don't want to have, be, have it based on vision. They think, that takes too long. Why, why would I participate in that? But the, the scripture actually says, no, the two have to come together. You're made in the very image of God, and God plans everything before he does it. Then he speaks it into existence. Well, we see a, a really interesting passage, and this should help you. You need to go look at this later on. Isaiah 46, verse 11. I believe that's right, or it's 19. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's in that direction. So if you don't see it when I first tell it to you, keep reading, you'll find it. And it states this. God said, there's no other God like me in the universe who plans the end from the beginning. So that actually means when we look at the idea of time, think about time like this. He's talking about time as chronology. All right, so here's your individual life. You're walking through time to the end of your existence. God has viewed all of it. So before you were ever created, he saw exactly what you were going to be like when you appeared to him at the end of your life. He knew exactly what you were going to accomplish. He knew what you had to go through to get to this place. He knew the gifts, the seasons, and times to get you here. He saw all that. And so, you guys ready? The reason you're on this planet right now is you are going to fulfill this. So after he, after he saw this and saw what you were going to be and what he needed to do so you would get here, then he went back in time and he made sure you were created. So this, how do you say this, is a mystery. All the things you go through, I hate that, and I hate that, and I hate that, and I hate these trials and all that other stuff. But if you could realize, this is going to get you to here. You are going to be that thing that Jesus said you're going to be. And so when you look back, back at all this stuff, it all makes sense. When you look forward, none of it makes sense. But from God's perspective, he, he gives you statements like, hey, that was a tragedy. I didn't plan for that, but I knew it was going to happen. So my, my attitude towards that tragedy is Romans, where he says he turns all things to good. So this all can be managed but because of the redemptive restoration work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what makes us be the person that he tells us we're going to be. So then Joseph saw in a dream, mm -hmm. right, a glimpse of heaven. 
Yep. Right? He was super excited about it. So he was like, dude, this happened. He saw himself up here, uh -huh. but he thought he was supposed to get the rewards of it here. <laughs> and so he shot his mouth off, and his brother said, that's enough. And then he was thrown in prison. But he had that to go through all that. And that was too. nice. All that yeah. had to happen, too. Yeah, you know, and Jesus says this to you guys. He says this to, to all of us. He basically says, now look, I didn't promise you. I almost said a rose garden. I didn't, I didn't promise you a rose garden, but I did say, look, you're going to have trials, but be of good cheer. Here we are to that thing again. I've overcome the world. You don't have to be afraid of that thing. So that actually means that God already knows exactly what that thing's going to do to you, and he's already seen that you've overcome it. So he tells you before it even happens, hey, don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of this thing. Now, I'm going to say one more thing, and then we're going to get into the exact thing about why goals are so important and how the Scripture develops it. I was just telling Cliff this on the way down here. I was uh, I was at a leaders meeting in Rochester. I told you guys that. And this guy said something about how people look at their lives and why they get bitter and upset about stuff. And they take the word uh, expectancy and they turn it into the word expect. Okay? So when you go through life and you expect God to do something that he hasn't told you he's going to do, and then it doesn't go that way, you get mad and upset with him. But that's not the way your heart's supposed to be. You're not supposed to be expecting, from your perspective, God should do this. You should be living as an expectant person for the goodness of God to come into every situation. That is going to keep you from being bitter and upset. Not This didn't turn out the way I wanted it to, so I'm mad at God because I thought he was going to do all this. He didn't ask you to expect him to do everything the way you wanted. He told you to live in expectancy of his goodness in every situation. All right, let's move through vision. So grab your Bibles, go with me real quick. Ooh, I'm already running out of time. It took too long to do that. Was it 4610? So I was off the scripture. Thank you, Liz. Okay, so would you guys go with me? Luke chapter 14, verse 28 through 30. And let's look at Jesus beginning to talk about this. Now, please remember that... Uh, I don't know if you guys have had someone ever share this with you, so I'm going to just kind of write it down here. Every time Jesus shows up on a scene and he begins to teach, I know that we all, I know that he is the teacher, that's the way he's described in Scripture, but you need to understand from what position he is teaching from, which means I could be a guy that picks up trash and teach you from being a trash man. That's my perspective, right? Or I can be a politician, and I can teach as a politician from my perspective of being a politician, right? So the, the place the person, the position the person holds and where they teach from has significance on what we listen to, right? So when Jesus is doing his teaching, he's teaching as a king about a kingdom. Very important that you remember what we would call that reality when you listen to Jesus talk about things. So, as a king in a kingdom, here's the guy that actually is the second person of the Trinity. So, what he says, he's talking about as a king from his kingdom, he's trying to explain how reality actually works. And he says this in Luke chapter 14, verse 28 through 30. For which of you, wanting to build a tower doesn't sit down and first compute the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid the foundation, he's not able to finish the tower, and all who see it begin to make fun of him, and they will say, this man began to build what was not able to finish. Okay, so you're like, what's the big deal? Uh, do you guys remember the year 2008, when the economy in the United States mm -hmm. just tanked? Yeah. Well, in Carnival Springs... There, there's a church that's called New Life. It's really big, and it's on the way out of Carver Springs. Well, Cliff and I usually take that road to take the back road to Denver, right? And in 2008, there was this building that was starting to get built, and then the economy collapsed, and that thing sat half-built for over eight years. Wow. And every time Cliff and I drove by it, we pointed at it and mocked it. Now, why do people... So Jesus is telling you a reality about something. Don't feel bad about it. Just understand it. Why is Jesus bringing this up here in Luke? He's trying to say the reason why people make statements about people not completing stuff and about these kind of things that people do in their life is because it shows the very fact that people 
are made to uh, create things and then complete them. And so when you don't, it shows a disconnect. Jesus is actually pointing it out. You were made to produce. And when you don't produce, it's confusing to people because you're made in the very image of God. You reflect this idea of creating things. And so Jesus is pointing it out. What was the problem in the parable? It wasn't that they created something. It was the fact that they didn't actually sit down. You guys ready? They didn't sit down and plan what they were going to do. That's the issue most of the time with people and their destiny. They get a vision, and they have no plan on how they're going to walk it out. They're confused all day long. Look back to God gave it. And they're, they're sitting around for 10 years, bouncing up and down and screaming and yelling, but God gave me this. Why isn't it being fulfilled? Because they didn't connect in their mind. That once God lays a blueprint in front of you, this is one of the blessings I had. My dad was an architect. And whenever he went to design stuff, I watched him put out his designs in front of the people that were paying for it and also the contractors that were working with him. He put the blueprint out and he would just basically said, okay, now look, this, this prairie right there, there's going to be a tree over there. We're going to build a wall over there. There's a swimming pool over here. We're going to dig up all the grounds. And what my dad did is in conceptual reality, he wrote out a plan that step by step so that what he saw in his mind became those people's backyard. Now, God comes and says something to you, right? Whatever it is, I want you to change your family. I want you to start a business. I want you to grow in doing this. Whatever he says to you, it is very important to get from him a plan how you're going to do this. Now, there's two ways that a plan comes to you. Don't miss this. Plans come by revelation, which means God personally speaks to you. God speaks it specifically. He just says, hey, go do this. Or he uses the body of Christ to speak to you. Okay, now, this is the part where, if you don't see this, it doesn't make sense. You might have a very unique plan, but it's the steps of walking it out will be similar, and so it shows you that God has shown other people in different times in church history or currently right now in the body of Christ the steps. You don't have to, you're not fulfilling what they're doing, but they show you the biblical steps to do it. And that's what the idea of the body of Christ can help you with this. This is um, in Ephesians when it's trying to talk about the, the gifts in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and it tells us that the goal of their ministry is so that you'll be equipped for the work of ministry. And then it starts getting into anatomy. And it says, look, we're held together by joints and ligaments. Well, those terms that are being used are this. For you to fulfill what God has called you to do, you have revelation given you, but you also have a community that's there to support you. You cannot do it without both. I, I don't know about you guys, but when I started hearing from the Lord, I thought, I don't need anybody. I could just get it all by revelation, and God was kind enough not to give me all revelation on stuff. He gave me glimpses and pictures and said, you've got to get the plan by hanging out with the body of Christ. And so you get it two ways. You have to get the plan. This, this almost sounds silly to say this. There are people that do not live by vision at all, but they have a plan, and they actually do a lot of things because they know how to plan. All right, now, the simplest way to learn how to plan is this. It's called backwards planning. Okay, so here's the final place you want to be, but you don't know where to start. Here you are trying to start. So what you have to do is you have to say, well, the final thing is this. So what do I, what's the one thing I have to do before that? And you figure out what that is. And then what do I have to do to cause that to happen? And then what do I have to do to cause that to happen? And what you do is you backward plan to yourself, and then you have the steps that you take to get yourself there. Like, uh, let's see if I can use an example. Uh, I'm supposed to write a book, all right? So the final product is a book, right? But what's the step right before I have the book in my hand? If you go, well, I don't know that. Well, then you go find out what it is. But what is it? Before I have the book in my hand, what's the step before that? Well, that's way back here. But what's the thing? What's the step right before I get the book in my hand? I'm not sure. So someone has actually published it. So that's that step. So I just mark that down. What do I have to do before the publisher gets it? 
I have to submit it. So I have to actually uh, send it to somebody. Right? What do I have to do before I send it? I have to actually design the cover. And then I have to make sure the manuscript is in place. Right? And I have to sit down at my typewriter and begin to start typing. And then I need to write an outline. Right? Then I need to dream. So, so okay. Here's a book. I dream, I put an outline, then I start typing it, then I get the manuscript there, I get the cover ready, I send it to somebody or I do it myself, the publisher does it, and then I get the final product called the book. That makes sense? Now, do you guys know that there's been thousands upon thousands of books written? And this step is so well known that if you don't know it, someone knows this. Well, it's the same thing with anything that Jesus has called you to do. So what God does is you, you, you see things, he shows you things, but he won't tell you everything so that you'll go search out this thing, either by people or he'll just tell you the next step is this. Remember, there, there's a part of Revelation that's kind of interesting. This part about dreaming is, it's like getting a picture in your mind. This is what God and you, this is what your future is going to look like. But then the scripture also uses the idea that God gives you a light for your feet, which means as you need the first step, he begins to shine on what it is. Either it's a relationship with somebody, or it's something you have to train yourself to think or do, or you have to put some action plan to it. Yeah, so this, this isn't confusing because you do this all the time in your everyday life. Like if I said, hey, let's go on a trip to California, we would sit around and plan it. You guys would probably even look at pictures of California just to start dreaming. Oh, I'm on the beach. I'm on the beach, right? And then you'd say, well, how am I going to get to the beach? Well, I guess I'm going to either use my car or I'm going to get a plane ticket. And then, well, we need to get the money for that. So we need a plan. And then I'm going to buy all these clothes to go out. And so we do this all the time. It isn't like this is some foreign thing. When God starts giving us something, he's giving us the picture of, hey, I want you over there. And I want you doing this. Now see, that's why this idea of planning and Jesus giving a plan by revelation is so important. We don't want to miss the steps, but we want to understand the steps. So the first part of the parable is Jesus is saying, this is why people can't complete things. is because they don't count and weigh what it takes to get to them. Uh, yeah, guys, just so you understand this, uh, I don't know if any of you want to write a book or have ever thought about writing a book. But uh, you learn stuff as you do stuff, too. Um, I, the very first book I wrote, I thought if I write it, like Fields of Dreams, if I write it, they'll come. Mm -hmm. I remember posting my first book and not one person buying it, and here it is finished. I'm like, I did it! And the Lord said, no, you just started the journey. Now you have to learn how to advertise, market, and get it in front of people. So that was another picture. And I realized, oh, so this is an ever-increasing thing that Jesus does. Anytime he shows you something new, you have to learn how he wants you to plan and walk it out. All right, look at another scripture with me. It's in Proverbs 24, verse 27. Proverbs 24, verse 27. All right, what are we being given here? This is actually <laughs> this is actually one of the funnest things. I, for a long time, I never understood what this meant. I have the, I have the Lord keep talking to me about this scripture. I don't have it right in front of me. Give me just a second here, and I'm going to look it up. Proverbs 24. You're probably already looking at it. 24 verse 7. Did I say 27? Okay, so it is 27. 24, 27. Sorry. Okay. Proverbs 24. Whoops. 24. Okay, so it tells us this. Okay. Now, it almost sounds like an obscure scripture, so listen to it. It says, prepare your work outside, get your fields ready, afterwards build your house. You guys ever read that through the Proverbs and go, okay. <laughs> How does that have anything to do with vision or walking out things that God has called you to do? And the Lord used to bring me back to this and say, you really need to study this part and learn this. And I'm like, well, what's? I don't, I don't get what I'm supposed to be learning. Now think about this. 
since we're not agricultural in our mindset, this, this scripture doesn't, but he's talking to an agricultural community when he's saying this. If you had a farm right now, the Bible would actually tell you, don't go build your house first. You go get the fields ready. Why would, why would, why is that wisdom? Do you guys know? So you have something to eat while you're building the house. Well, you, you, you get resources first, and then you sell them. Okay, now, <clears throat> so you ready? Uh, by the way, that was right, John. Sorry, I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't acknowledge that. So, you have to start getting resources towards whatever God has called you to first before you build the buildings <laughs> or do whatever you're going to do. So, God has to give you an ability to give resources to you first. So, anything that you're going to do with the Lord first, you have to have the finances and the resources coming into it before you do any other building because if you start building without resources it's going to die and you're and that's not counting the cost and you're only going to get a half of it done because you haven't got the money in place now i didn't say you, you have to raise three million that's not what i'm saying so let me make sure i say it correctly so that you understand it you have to have in place you don't have to have all the money but you have to have in place a way for the money to come in so you can do it you don't have to have it all in. You have to have a way for it to come in. It's like, in a sense, you're creating the... Uh, you guys ever heard this term? You never want to kill the golden goose. You have to have the thing produce golden eggs before you can build your house and do all that other stuff. And that's what the scripture is talking about here. You have to have an ability for resources to come to you first. And by the way, if you were starting a business, right, that's why most people go take out a loan, because they have to have the resources first. And they believe that by... Doing whatever it is and having the resources, resources now will consistently come in so that they can do what they've been, what they what they're dreaming about. So the Bible has no problem with this. I don't know why we have a problem with this, but a lot of people when they say, Well, I'm doing this by faith, what they're actually saying is, I'm gonna circumvent this whole thing and just launch out and expect God to save me in the end. Alright? Now, that sounds almost like biblical faith, doesn't it? But it isn't, because the Bible right here is telling you that's not even how God works. So you guys ready? Anytime God shows you something in the future, he shows it to you so you come into agreement and say yes, but the next question you should be is, how do you want me to create the resources so that it will come in? Do you want me to ask people to give to me? Do I, should I develop, or I should say it this way, should I develop something for people to buy? What is it that you need me to put in place so that resources come in so that now when I build the house of whatever this thing is, my destiny, it has resources coming into it consistently so I can fulfill it. Um, don't be stressed out about this. This is God's joy that you know this. Okay? So, <clears throat> I don't know if you guys are going to enjoy this, but when, I had, when God started having this conversation with me, uh, it, <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny. I'm going to draw it how the Lord showed it to me. He showed me a circle. Now, I don't know if you guys are going to want to be public speakers, but I'm going to show you how to be a public speaker. Now, you can, put, you can use this wheel for anything, all right? So when, I, when I, the Lord had me start plumb line, which I'm going to put up here right here, plumb line, I'm like, well, how do I go do all this? I said, no one knows me. No one's asking me to speak. No one's doing any of that stuff. And he said, all I want you to do right now is start uh, reading the Bible, Studying and writing sermons. That's all I want you to do in this season. So that's what I did. Every night for an hour, I pulled out the Bible, prayed, and studied it. Anytime God showed me something in Scripture, I started researching why he showed that to me, and then I'd write sermons, literally outlines on. After I had ten outlines on something, the Lord said, Okay, now that, that's enough for you to actually go out and rent out a facility and do free, I don't know if you guys know the world of free advertising, but there's free advertising all over the place that you don't have to pay a penny for. To, and all you do is you just rent a place really cheap or ask someone to let you use a place, and you go teach your 10 things that you actually have. Now, don't do like I did. I wasn't smart enough to have people record it, but you make sure they record it. Okay, now, so far I've read, studied, written, taught... Now, after I have the 10, what, what immediately comes out of that? I have my first resource, which is called the tapes, and the writing of that thing I just went and did research on. 
And so now the next time I go rent a facility and I teach it again, I'm selling tapes and the writings on it. Then I find someone like Cliff and I make him not go and do his job and then he videotapes <laughs> me. And now, again, when I, God tells me to go teach it again, now I have the research, which is tapes, the writings, uh, the videos of it. I sell all of those, and the whole time I'm doing it, then I take an offering for it, and so I have resources, resources, resources coming in so that I can keep moving forward. Then after all this is developed, and God has me go teach again, or people start inviting me, every time I go, all these things go with me, and it constantly brings resources in. And then after you've done a hundred of these, you realize I've got more than that. I've got stuff for seminars now. I have stuff for conferences I can actually start inviting people to do this with me because there's this reputation of me doing this. And this isn't you sitting around waiting for someone to slap you on the head and say you're anointed. Do it's it. you taking God seriously yeah. and doing it. Right? Because yeah. uh, most people don't give people the chance to do anything. They don't want the undeveloped, re they, they don't want to put the chance into the undeveloped person. So you've got to get the experience somewhere. So some of it, you just, uh, guys, when I first started this, I did. I even just did all my teaching in small groups. I mean, the very first small group, <laughs> when the Lord told me this, I was 24 years old. That's now almost 30 years ago. And I, had, I went down to Radio Shack. I, was, I didn't have enough money. I bought one of those goofy little uh, tape recorders, right? And have you ever bought one of those plastic microphones, guys? <laughs> They're like for five bucks, yes. and I plugged it into that thing. And I remember the first time I sat my small group, and I, I turned on the record and the play, and every, I turned it on, and I said, okay, so guys, we're going to do, I'm going to do the teaching in the small group, but I'm going to record it, and the very first tape I had was people laughing the whole entire time as I, because they just thought it looked ridiculous with me with this $5 microphone doing all this stuff, but you guys get it? God started showing me this wheel. Do not despise. Yeah, and so, and most people do. That's right. They see God, they usually see the big picture, and they say, yeah, I want to be in front of a thousand people, and that's supposed to happen tomorrow. But why, why would, if you ran a business, you wouldn't take someone and they go, well, I want to be a master plumber. And you say, well, I know you don't have any training whatsoever, but go work on this building over here. <laughs> Who thinks like that? But we think like that in the kingdom. You have to do these things, all right? Uh, let's say that uh, I've done this stuff too. Let's say that, um, and please remember, all of this is based on vision. Anytime God gives me a new assignment, I start by creating a vision for it. I talk about the vision. I communicate with people. I see if God awakens something inside of them, and then I go through the same pattern. I research it. I study it. I write on it. I teach on it. I research. I write. I videotape it. And all of a sudden, it creates whatever Jesus wants it to create. Uh, I, my dad used to run his own company. He did the, kind of the same thing. He just said, well, I'm an architect, and I want to do this. And so what he did is he started communicating the vision through what? Advertising. Made everybody know, here's what I do. Here's what I am. He'd get recommendations from people. And then he, when he would go out there, he would tell them what he had already done for other people. He developed it because of his job, and then... What they would do is they'd say yes, and he would document the whole entire process that he went through so that the next person came. And his business just kept growing all over the place. Now, see, that's why I said it doesn't matter if you're in ministry or running a business. It isn't that hard to figure this out. The problem is, is having this big picture given to you and going, is this supposed to fall out of the sky on me? I mean, what is this supposed to happen? No, it always starts with God saying, okay, you're going to have to change the way you think about things, and you're going to have to change what you give your time to. I mean, let me take this very first one where God told me I had to read, research, and write. That meant that something was going to change in my life, and I had to agree to it. Now, at that time, they didn't have Netflix, or I'd make a Netflix statement. But that meant that at 9 o'clock, when everybody in the church that I went to all watched Star Trek, The Next Generation, I didn't. I had to give myself to a new reality that was being shown to me, so I gave myself an hour from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock every night. Instead of watching Star Trek The Next Generation and keeping up with everybody in church, I ended up not knowing what Captain John Luke Picard was doing anymore. And I was finding out what Jesus was saying, here's your destiny. And this really started satisfying me. Really started satisfying me, because there's life in this that you cannot get by just vegging all the time. 
I always say this, it makes everyone always mad at me. Has anyone ever watched Dancing Dancing with the Stars? Is anyone going to admit this in this room? You know, uh, that's fine, that's great, you guys want to watch that, that's very creative and all that fun stuff. But if God has called you to do something and you're sitting there mm -hmm. watching Dancing with the Stars and just being entertained, but you're not living with what God has created you to do, do you know that that very thing that you think is entertaining will become stagnant and boring and the Spirit has yeah. intentionally made it that way so you'll get off that stuff and get on with what you're supposed to be about? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you'll find entertainment actually doesn't satisfy you after a while if God has given you a vision for something. The vision starts consuming your attention and then these things don't satisfy you anymore. And I think that's intentional by the Lord. So you'll stop wasting your resources and time and everything on that. Okay, so you guys get it? Yes. God wants to show you how the field comes so that the resources will come so that there's this ever-increasing developing thing. Um, if, I could, if I could say this um, kindly. You don't have to, just say it. Okay, maybe I won't say it, but I need to. Uh, the reason why most of us are not where we're at is because we feel we need someone to approve of what God has created us to do instead of just accepting it and saying, well, in reality, I really am going to stand before the Lord. And he and could you? So think of all this. We're all sitting in a room right now, and Jesus is sitting right there. And this is the final discussion about our lives with Jesus, right? Jesus isn't going to come off his throne and go, okay, now Liz, that thing I created you to do, why didn't you do it? Now, I'm not saying you didn't. But Liz goes, well, because Lee never acknowledged that I had this call in my life. And Jesus would probably go, well, what does, what does Lee's opinion have to do with what you and I were talking about? I mean, what are we going to say to him in that day? No. Well, I mean, who wants that? I don't want to say this, Lord. Well, I was just so driven by the fear of man that I yeah. couldn't do it. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah. Guys, please understand this. What I'm about to say to you is going to be the critical thing that helps you in this process of planning your life. When God speaks a vision or dreams with you, no one else has heard that conversation. And because of that, revelation to a person is awakening, but when other people don't hear that conversation, it looks like they're insane when they say the things they say. Every time God spoke to one of the patriarchs in the Old Testament, everyone else thought they were out of their minds. Because if you don't have that same revelation, it doesn't make sense to you. So when someone tells me, well, God, this, it takes time to learn to do this. When, when people tell me, God has called me to do that, when they tell it to me, I have no idea how they're going to even do the thing they say God's going to do. But you can tell that God has spoken to them because they're awakened to it. And they really want to give their life to it. And what we end up doing is we throw a blanket on them and go, I don't know how that's going to happen. Uh, I don't know if you guys... <laughs> when the Lord told me to start plumb line, um, I'll explain the technique, but when the Lord told me, I started sharing this with everybody, and people weren't trying to be mean to me. They just didn't have the same conversation with the Lord that I did. They said, well, how are you going to do it? That sounds great, guy. But yeah, and, and our... No one in our family's ever done that. Or our family doesn't do that kind of stuff. Or who do you think you are? Who do you think yeah. uh, that, that's actually what Joseph got from his family. Who do you think you are? Yeah. But see, that shows that he heard that, but his family didn't. So they, they just thought he was out of his mind. Okay, that's the wheel. But this is something you need to pay, pay attention to as you move forward. When God wants you to do something, he's got to give you a plan. Basic steps to walk it out. How do I get there? That's what we see from that scripture. All right, let's look at one more scripture, and then we'll be done for this evening. <laughs> All right, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. Have you guys ever looked at Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2? It's an awesome scripture. I love this. By the way, if you want to, out of all, think about this. All the people in the Old Testament, all of them, none of them explain practical steps of how revelation comes and what to do with it. Only Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2 deals with it. Isn't that amazing? Both in the Old and New Testament, they all tell you, hear God's voice. But none of them tell you the practical steps how to do it. Only Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 2, tells you. So this scripture actually needs to be something that, if you guys really want to grow in walking out what God's called you to do and how to receive revelation, you, you need to saturate yourself and practice this consistently. Okay, Habakkuk 2, chapter 2, verse 2. He says this, The Lord told me to go... Uh, uh, set myself on the rampart, 
Rampart is a high place. Okay, so a high place in the Old Testament is where God, that's the idea of hearing the voice of the Lord. All right? So when God tells you to go to a high place, it means get alone with me. And I want you to catch the language that's used here in back at uh, chapter 2, verse 2. Let me catch up with you real quick. It, it says that you're supposed to go to a high place, and it says he looked, he looked to see what he would say to me. Okay, that's an interesting language, isn't it? What version are you Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. What version is that? Chapter 2. Well, let me get there. Okay, yeah, so uh, Habakkuk. Is that what you guys are up? Yeah. Habakkuk. Chapter 2, verse 1, I'm sorry. I stand on my watch and I set myself on the rampart. I will look to see what he will say to me. And what, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And so, see what he says? He says, I went to my watch. That's a watchtower. That's what prophet, that's a, a symbolic illustration they used in the Old Testament. So here's a watchtower. And then, you know, you have these interesting walls that come from the watchtower. Well, when he says, I went to my watch, it means he went up to a place high so he could not be disturbed by the distraction so that he could, what? Look to see what he would say to me. So it doesn't say, I went to listen to what he would say to me. It said, I went to look. Okay, that's the idea of a vision. Vision, by the way, in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, it doesn't matter which one we're talking about. When we say a vision, let's be very specific about it. Vision, the way it's used, not the word, but the way it's used in the Old and New Testament means an encounter, encounter with the presence of the Lord. Okay? So a vision is both audible and visual. It's not, vision always means picture. It means, in, first and foremost, it's an encounter. So here's what Habakkuk says. He says, now, I went to a quiet place. And did you notice he said, and I didn't stand before God and said, you need to run the universe this way. It didn't say I prayed or anything. It said, I went and I stood there and I looked. Now, how can you look? It's really interesting to say a language like that, right? If you and I, uh, how do I say this? In your mind, you have this thing called an imagination, right? Isn't that amazing we use that word? Because the word for vision or dream means to imagine or create. And we have this thing, an imagination. So it means that we have a screen in our head where pictures can be put upon. It. We either pop the picture from our own soul, or the Lord drops it in it, or the enemy drops it in it. But we have this screen in our imagination that can now put before the Lord and say, now speak to me, and he can put a picture there, or he can talk. So I don't know if anyone's ever said this to you guys in your prayer life. You should actually go to look to see if God says something to you before you talk at him about the ruling of the universe. You ought to just say, okay, show me what's going on in my life, or show me what's going on in my family's life, or show me what you want me to know in this season of my life, and you're looking to see what he will say to you. Once you look to see what he says to you, the next step, uh, this is step one, the next step, step two is, he tells you to write it down. Write it down. How many of you have a journal or someplace you write down everything that the Lord says to you? Now, you guys ready? Where do we get this? Now, Moses and everybody modeled this, but he actually tells you, the, the Lord actually tells him intentionally, write the vision and make it plain on a tablet that he who he may run who reads it. So you write down what God tells you. This is the idea of a blueprint. So I'm going to just kind of, in a sense, draw this idea that here's a blueprint. And what God does is he just tells you, do this, do this, do this. He's making it plain to you. He gives you five or six steps. Right? I'm going to share one of these with you here in just a sec. And he tells you, go do this, now go do this, and then go do this, and then do this, and then do this, and do this. That, that's making it plain, isn't it? Here it is. I want you to do these five things. Right? Why, why does God want you to do this? Step three. Now, don't circumvent this. Don't get this switched around because this is the way it works. Step three is I run with it. Once I get it, I go do it. So the idea is... Do it. Who, what sports company tells you to do it all the time? Nike. So this isn't a Nike. This slogan didn't come from Nike. It came from the Lord. 
But most people try to go do it before they write it down or they get the vision. So this is how the Lord actually communicates with people. Get this from me first, then write it down, then go do it. So last weekend, I told you guys I was up in Minnesota before I went to this leaders thing. Um, I'm part of a school up there, and we brought like three locations together, and we taught on words of knowledge specifically so that we could go do prophetic evangelism at the Mall of America. Do you guys know what Mall of America is? Okay, so there was 40 of us. We broke up in groups of two, and what we did is we actually got before the Lord. So we practiced word of knowledge for uh, six hours. Hair, age, injuries, colors, and we practiced with each other. Then we said, okay, now we're going to take this piece of paper. All of us put a piece of paper in front of us, and we said, okay, God, give us five or six things about the person you want us to do a treasure hunt or prophetic evangelism with. And we all just sat there and wrote down, I wrote down five things. I was going to meet an elderly lady. I actually saw a picture of her in my head. Uh, and she actually had a cane. I saw her with a cane. She was crippled from walking and hunched over. She had a daughter that she was in conflict with. And that the Lord actually wanted to speak comfort to her. Those were the things I got. And I just wrote them down on a piece of paper. And then I went away over to the students. Does everybody have three or four things? Everybody raised their hands. So now we, you ready? We, now, did you guys ever do this? Well, that's enough. I heard, I actually heard from the Lord. And I got five things. So I can go watch the Minnesota Vikings lose <laughs> football now. I don't have to ever go do it. It was enough that I did that. No, we all actually had to actually get in our car while it was snowing drive to the Mall of America and get out of the car and deal with all the fear and trepidation that goes on in the heart after you actually get this stuff and then you have to do something with it. You guys ready? The guy I went with, his name's Paul. That's the guy I do this stuff with. And he got some guy that um, he got a name and he had this leather jacket on. And so we're walking through it. I actually think, well, we're going to find Paul's person's first. Paul's person first. So I'm looking around the Mall of America for his... Person. Have you guys ever been to the Mall of America? Yeah. yeah. So in the middle of it, they have this amusement park. Mm -hmm. So we're walking on the first floor through the amusement park, and I'm looking for a guy, an elderly guy with a jacket, and he said he had a red scarf also, and so I'm looking around. I keep seeing people with jackets but not scarves, and we're trying to figure out who it is, and I'm just kind of looking at a gentleman over here, and I just kind of turn my head like this, and there's the lady. <laughs> Literally. Right, looked right. exactly like I, she had the cane and everything, and I said, Paul, look at that. And and we both looked at each other like, now, do you guys ever do this? God actually told you, and you're like, I don't know if that, yeah, I mean, almost right. exactly, perfectly, yeah. I don't know, that's the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so I just walked towards her, and I said, um, hi, my name's Brian, what's your name? And she told me her name, and I said, I'm, I'm with a group, and we're learning to practice blessing people. Would you mind if I just speak a blessing over you? And she goes, yeah, that's fine. But she goes... I need to go over here and buy this thing. I work over at that kiosk. Can you come and see me in a few minutes? I said, yeah, that's fine. Right? Because you don't force people. No, you got to do it right now. I said, I said, yeah, that's fine. So she took off, and we walked around looking for this guy. So um, we found Paul's guy, but he was walking so fast with his wife, there's these, can you imagine me and another guy are chasing him through a mall in America <laughs> until we actually got him cornered. We actually walked in front of him and turned around like this so we could move any other direction so that we could actually bless him. All right, so we get done with that. I walk back, and now I, I forgot where she said the kiosk was at. So now we're walking through the park, and I'm like, and I said to the Lord, I said, that was really dumb of me. Now I'm not going to find her. And right after I put my hands on my face and said, that was really dumb, I opened my eyes, and she was right there. I said, man, the Lord really wants me to do this. I, I don't have a choice. I mean, how yeah. obvious is this? So Paul... Paul sat down, and I walked over to her, and I said, hey, do you remember? She goes, wow, you actually found me, and I said, I did. I said, uh, can I, now, this blessing, can I just share with you what I got? She said, well, well, sure. I said, well, I felt like the Lord showed me that you're in pain, and obviously you have this cane, and I'm supposed to pray for you, so would that be okay? She said, well, sure. So I prayed for her back. And um, then I said, and you have a daughter, is that correct? And she said, well, yes, I do. And I said, and you and her are not seeing eye to eye on a couple of things? And she said, yeah, that's right. And I said, well, let's pray for that. And so we started praying for her about that. Then, um, right after the end of it, I get through all that stuff, and I said, you know, um, the reason why the Lord sent me here to do this with you is because he's intentionally trying to show you that he is going to be with you in life and that he is for you. Now, after I said that to her, <laughs> she, 
She started in on reincarnation. Oh boy. Seeing a UFO. <laughs> And believing that Mary has healed her of something. Now, doesn't that sound like a co-experience? I thought, this is the most awesome thing I've ever been put in a situation. So I just talked with her about all that stuff. And started relating to her. And it was, you guys ready? It was an awesome experience. Awesome experience. Then, after, you guys ready? Just uh, just finish the story so you understand it. I get done with her. I, I'm done now. I'm waiting for my ride to get back to where we have to go, and we're just sitting on a bench towards one of the doors, and this guy, out of, I'm amazed, once you obey the Lord, the Spirit rests on you. And now, uh, we're not even we're not even trying to do stuff, and this guy uh, just randomly comes up and just starts talking to me. And I'm like, well, this is weird. And he's asking me, well, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a minister. And he says, really? What, like, what is that like? And I'm just kind of explaining it to him. And... <laughs> This lady right next to us is listening to this conversation, right? And he, they walk off. They walk off. And the lady turns to me and she says, you're a minister? And I said, yeah. She goes, I, I'm in pain. Could you pray for me right now? And I said, absolutely. So we just walk over to her. What, what are you dealing with? Well, I'm, I, I, um, I um, have problems with my heart and stuff like that. But she's a, a, a lady that lives on the street. And she's in the Mall of America trying to stay warm if you guys know what was going on last week and that makes sense so I said um, okay so I am wanting to bless you I'm going to ask the spirit of God I, I said I don't know if that makes any sense I'm going to ask the spirit of the Lord to minister to you would you be comfortable with that she said well sure I said I, would it be alright with you if I put my hand on your shoulder and she said go for it so I prayed for her I said alright now Holy Spirit bring your power and your presence over her and bless her right now I said now what are you experiencing she goes well I don't really know how to describe this. She says, I, I, I can tell that something spiritual is happening right now. I said, well, that works for me. And so, I'm, and then all of a sudden, you guys understand how much God loves people, right? God's given me his heart for her. You guys ready? Now, I'm doing it in the moment, but the same thing is happening. God has given it to me. I'm writing it down now on my heart, and I'm doing it with her right there on the spot. Now, because this is kind of something we hardly teach, or it seems so foreign, we try to make this an event, where this should actually become a lifestyle. Every situation I get into, I should be going to the Lord and going, what do you want me to do here? Writing it down and paying attention to it, and then going and doing what he tells me to do. Okay. All right, so that's what we get in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2, 1 and 2, I should have put 1 and 2, that we need to know when it comes to this idea of walking out things that God has given us to do. Uh, let me make sure I say this real quick because, um, yeah, good. Aha. Sorry, guys, one more scripture. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14 is the final one. Okay, so when we talk about goal setting, this has got, you're going to actually find that the Bible actually makes this, this kind of shocking statement. Now, listen to what Paul says here, okay? Now, have, is, has any, has anyone ever talked to you, here we're talking about goals and stuff, but has anyone ever talked to you guys about how to focus on something? How, how to actually make sure this thing that God has given you becomes a priority? So, focus has to do with priority, okay? So, whenever God gives you something, you have to, you have to, cultivate it and learn to focus on it. Okay, so it says this in Philippians 3, verse 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained this, that is, I have not already been perfected, but I strive to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Do you guys get the reality? He's talking about salvation here. And he's saying, okay, now, Jesus gripped me with this, but in response to him gripping me with this, I'm going to grip him in it. Well, that's the whole process we just talked about right here. If God shows you something, he's gripping you with it. You need to grip him with it also. It's not enough just to receive it. And then he says this, uh, For which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself having obtained this. Instead, I am single-minded. Forgetting the things that are behind and reaching out for the things that are ahead. 
With this goal in mind, I strive towards the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So, he's saying, when I get am given something from God, that becomes a priority, and now what I do is I give time focusing on that, dreaming about that, and moving forward to that, because that's where, this is the term we always use, that's where the grace of God has been given to me. Now, think about that. That means that the way the Bible describes it is you learn to be a receiver first, then you learn to be a pursuer. A lot of times people turn around and they say, no, you pursue first, and then you receive. Can you say that again? Yeah. So the Bible is saying here, based on this chapter in Philippians, God does something in you first, and then you pursue whatever he's showing you. A lot of people say, well, no, you pursue first, and then you receive from the Lord. But we learn to be a receiver. Yeah, so the, the posture in the Christian experience is to partake of these things that God wants to freely give you, and then walking out whatever that looks like. That's the idea of bearing fruit and walking it out. And, and single-mindedness is really interesting because in James, when it talks about double-mindedness, the idea is this. You have value systems in your heart, right? So there are things that you give, what you give your time to and what you think about is what you value. So think about it. There are some people, sadly to say, that they think about worry and fear, and that's actually what they value because if they didn't care about it, they wouldn't think and contemplate it constantly. So if, I, if I'm weak, which I am, if I'm weak within myself, I don't try to say, well, I don't know how to be strong. What I do is the very strength is whatever God gives me. And the more I meditate on it and ponder it, I actually, in a sense, draw strength from it. The grace of God is given to me in that thing. Not only creativity, but strength is given to me. So if I, it's like, remember um, when the scripture talks about fix your eyes on Jesus? Well, that's, that, that's the principle of single-mindedness. Fix it. Not look at Jesus every 20 years. Oh, hey, I remember there's Jesus. It's actually saying, no, all the stuff that can get your attention, you're to bump it, and then here's what you're supposed to be actually focusing on. Now, what's a fanatic? What's a fanatic? Do you guys know? <laughs> Someone that's so what's a fan? Someone that's obsessed with something. Yeah, a fan is a fanatic. It's just a short term for a fan. So, do you know someone that's an intense Denver Bronco fanatic? JR. Okay. What do they talk about? That's true. Huh? What do they talk about? Football. What do they think about? Football. What do they give their time to? Football. <laughs> yeah. So, whatever you give your time to, your attention to, and you are communicating with people, that's what your focus on, and that's what your attention is about. Okay? So Paul's saying, recognize that and filter through all that. What God has given you should be the highest form of what you talk about, what you dream about, and what you plan for. Just like if you plan for, oh, I'm going to go to California. Well, you would get excited about it, talk about it. Everybody got around, you had to tell everybody about it. There's nothing wrong with being that way. The Bible's saying, let that actually be the way you are. So if I don't know how to do that, I intentionally say, okay, I have to give time to this process of what God has shown me. I have to dream with God about it. I have to start planning on what it's going to look like. Um, think about this with me, guys. I'm going to tell you a really funny story. Um, I don't know if I have, uh, most people don't even know who this person is, but there's this guy named James Gall. Have you guys ever heard of James Gall? Well, I used to be on staff with him back in 1994 through 96. And so, um, one of the right before, he used to live in Kansas City, and that's when I was on staff with him. And one of the last trips that he had, this is when his wife was alive. One of the last trips that he had was to Columbia, Missouri, and I was obviously on staff, so I had to go with him. And um, we get there, and I was trying to figure out how God does a certain thing in ministry. Right? Uh, how do you do that, Lord? I mean, what does that look like? And then I went to this minister's house. I, because I was on staff, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but usually when a speaker comes in. Everybody gives their attention towards the speaker, the staff who cares what they think, just go get the boxes and all that other stuff. So I'm eating a meal with these guys, and no one's talking to me. And so I'm trying to still in my head, try to figure out, well, how does that thing work? Right? I, I talked to them, but no one wanted to talk to me. And so we're in their house. Where they just finished this really nice meal, and they announced to us, well, it's nap time. What? It's nap time. 
after dinner? After lunch. Oh, after we had a lunch. meal. We had oh, a meeting okay. at seven o'clock, and so they we weren't going to eat before that. So we ate a late lunch, and they said, "Well, we're all we're all tired, so let's all take a nap. We'll get ready for the meeting. Just time to think and reflect." Now, I, you guys, I'm in my thirties. I don't need an adult people to tell me it's time for me to take a nap. I think I passed that after I was a little child. <laughs> I, just thought, I just thought that's the silliest thing I've ever heard. So instead of insulting everybody, they, they walk me into their kid's bedroom and, and they point out this little one single bed that has um, sheets that have the peanuts on them. And they're like, here's your room. And I'm like, great. And so I'm just telling you the process here. And so I walk in there and they go close the door on me. I thought that was funny too. Close the door on me, and they go off to their rooms, these rooms, and Jim goes in his private room, and he takes a nap, and they go in their room, and they take a nap. And I'm stuck in this kid's bedroom on a peanut, <laughs> peanut blanket going, I really don't want to take a nap. <laughs> and so, yeah, it wasn't that, but it was like, this is kind of silly. And I didn't have a car to get out of there, and so I was stuck. And so I'm laying on the bed, and I'm trying to work through this thing about how ministry works. And so at the time, I was trying to figure out how do you get words of knowledge where God tells you people's names, conditions in their life, and stuff like that? Because I, I didn't have anyone showing me how to do all that. So I just thought, well, I get, and all I did is in my mind, I imagined, I guess it would look like I'd point at a lady over here, and her name was um, Linda, and she had two kids, and she's been struggling financially. I'm, I'm creating this scene in my head that I'm that lady's name and what's going on and stuff like that, right? And then I said, and then it'd be like I'd point over here and go, there's a gentleman named Bill over there, and he's a painter, and he's also being raised up as a teacher in the body of Christ, and here's what the, and I'm doing, I'm just, I guess that's the way it would come. I'm thinking like that, right? Right in the middle of that. Lord, the Lord actually filled my heart. He said, no, wait a minute, Brian. The minute you decided that you were going to, Give your focus on how to do this. And you said, I guess there would be a woman, and you got the name. You said, I entered into it, and I told you her name. There's a lady tonight, and she's sitting over here, and her name is Gwen. That was it, Gwen. And she has two kids, a girl and a boy. And they're struggling financially, and they wonder if I've abandoned them. And I want you to tell them that I'm going to meet all their needs in their life. And I'm just like, I can't believe it comes this easy. Well, the reason it comes so easy is because I finally focused on it. He said, and I gave you that guy also. There's a guy, and he's sitting, he's a painter, and you're going to see him in the middle of the audience, and his name is Bill, or what, Bob, whatever it was, and he's being, I'm raising him up as a teacher, and I'm like, this is awesome. Now, you guys ready? Why did I get that? Because I actually stuck in that oh, I, I focused on, on it, it <laughs> and kept trying to wait for God to give me a picture That's on right. it, and he finally did. Uh -huh. Do you know how much fun it was to go to that meeting that night? You're thinking, oh, that's just awesome. I got, and so um, we get into the meeting. They stick us out. They always stick ministers on stage. I always try to figure out why they do that. Why do they stick ministers on stages? Me too. Like, they're, everyone's in the audience worshiping. You're just sitting up there, and everybody's just watching. And it's like, this is ridiculous. And so I'm standing up there, and I'm like, well, now, how do you want me to do this, Lord? And the Lord said, well, you know, at a certain point, they're going to do ministry, and I want you to tell Jim. And I'm like, hey, Jim, I feel like I got someone's name. And he's like, all right. So, you guys, anytime you watch something out, the minute you take a step of obedience, this incredible stuff that you never want to deal with comes yeah. up in your heart. My heart's beating so hard. <laughs> oh, is Jesus actually going to show up? And now all this doubt and unbelief's filling me, right? And when you have the vision, none of that's going on, right? Mm -hmm. It's like glory land. Now I'm saying, and then when I got up there, my heart was beating so hard, I actually thought I was going to pass out on the stage. This is what you do these things. Yeah, I have to be honest with you guys, because if you think everyone, oh yeah, I just knew. And so I look over there, and for the life of me, there she is. I'm like, oh my goodness, there she is. Because she had her two kids right next to her, like I saw in the picture that I saw. And I said, um, and so it was about time for me to do ministry. I said, ma'am, is your name Gwen? And she screamed. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, the Lord's speaking to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always amazed when people do that. And I said, you have two children, right? And she screamed again. Ah! <laughs> and I said, one's a girl and one's a boy. And the girl's older, right? Ah! <laughs> 
<laughs> I said, um, I felt like the Lord was sharing, showing me that you're struggling financially and you're wondering if the Lord's actually going to meet your needs in your life. And he wanted me to specifically call you out and tell you that he's your provider and you have nothing to be. Oh, she screamed even louder. Ah! <laughs> and now she's sobbing. And this really weird ex expression came over the audience. <gasps> That's the first time I'd ever done that. Then I look, you guys ready? I thought, well, this is awesome. So I'm looking at the audience, and there's the guy. Exactly how I saw him in a picture. He had a white shirt on and everything. Looked like he just got done painting. I'm like, hey, is your name Bill? I think it was Bill. I don't know why I keep going between Bob and Bill. And he's like, I said, is your name Bill? And, ah! He starts screaming. Which I don't understand the screaming thing. <laughs> I said, you work kind of like in construction and you're a painter. So, ah! And I said, and you're also being raised up as a teacher in the body of Christ. And, ah! <laughs> right? <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to finish because I would have been yeah. just cracking. So, you guys ready? <laughs> what is all that? That's learning to do. And that's yeah. the mystery and the joy of walking with Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's going to show you things that are going on in heaven. You just got to have to connect with him and... Do some of this stuff. It's yeah. just so much fun. It's yeah. exhausting. All right, let's pray. It is fun. Oh, it's gone. Okay. All right, Lord, as we hear the first part of this, I, I really ask that you would tap into our soul right now with your presence. And the love that we need to experience for this to be awakened to us, would you flood our souls with it right now? And would you position our emotions and our thoughts to a place <clears throat> where we can receive from you your voice, your impressions, your visions? Would you allow us to, this place that you talk about, would you allow us to tap into hope from your kingdom? And then, Lord, the things that go on in each one of us, all the things that the enemy tries to just kind of put his hands on to keep us from moving forward, would you, by your love, work us through that so that we can do these things? I bless you, mighty one. I thank you for your goodness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Mm -hmm.